from LEX 18, your official UK sports station for Big Blue Nation, this is BBN Tonight, presented by UK Federal Credit Union. Welcome to BBN Tonight. I'm Anna Tarullo. And I'm Keith Farmer. And tonight begins a really big weekend for Kentucky football. The NFL draft <laughs> starts at 8 o'clock Eastern time, and we're going to get you ready for that. That's right. Plus, the Catsbees were last night. Maggie Davis was there, and she'll have a recap for us. But, hey, we're beginning with the National Football League. <laughs> the big dog NFL liaison Vince Merrow, who says as many as eight cats could be drafted. That's tonight's Big Blue Story, presented by CHI St. Joseph Health. Under Mark Stoops, Kentucky has had some of the best years in program history as far as sending players to the pros. Since he took the reins, 18 guys have heard their name called. Six times a cat has made a Pro Bowl. There have been three first round picks. Jamin Davis went 19th overall last year, Josh Allen 7th in 2019, and Bud Dupree 22nd overall in 2015. And then of course, Mike Edwards became just the fifth Wildcat in history to win a Super Bowl. And if Vince Merrill is right, and six to eight Wildcats are selected. This will be the second time in the Super Bowl era that Kentucky has had five or more picks in consecutive drafts. The only other time being 1978 and 79. Here's a rundown of the 10 guys hoping to have their name called. If anyone goes tonight, it's going to be Jerry and Kennard. He's the best shot. But multiple cats could hear their name called Friday in rounds two and three. Wondell Robinson, Josh Pascal, and Luke Fortner are all waiting for the phone to ring. Then on Saturday, we'll be on high alert for Yusuf Corker, Josh Ali, Marquand McCall, Dare Rosenthal, Justin Rigg, and Quandre Mosley. Plus, former cat Terry Wilson, he's also looking for his shot at the pros. But Darian Kennard is hoping to be the first cat off the board. Remember, he came back for his senior season to improve his draft stock and show the NFL that he's a complete football player. That's right. His last season maybe didn't go as he had planned. Instead of, instead of moving to the left side of the line, he started at right tackle. But he made a personal sacrifice, and he showed the league that not only was he one of the most talented tackles in college football, but he's also a team-first guy. Are you tired of interviews yet? Like, it's been probably... Quite the few weeks. A couple hundred interviews already, yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, but so, I mean, you've been good at them anyways. So, like, when you have to go and. Shout out St. Ignatius, because, uh, you know, they had a speech class. So, oh, yeah. it definitely helped a lot. <laughs> um, and being here, kind of just like getting used to it. You know, I've been having interviews since freshman year, so yeah. it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to yeah. just kind of like get up here and talk and just kind of be myself. It's definitely a lot less anxious yeah, when, for uh, sure. when you're yeah. definitely more confident. And, uh, more relaxed doing it. How was it talking to kind of some of the the big wigs in in the NFL industry? How was that? Uh, I think it was fun. I mean, at the same time, I'm not talking to them, you know. Big wigs are just kind of in the back taking notes on you. <laughs> but uh, just talking to the guys who are at that level and coaching at that level, it's pretty cool. It's showing that what I've been doing so far is working out and what I've been doing is kind of paying off. So it's a big deal and it's fun. I can imagine it's been sort of a whirlwind but exciting and not sure if it was if you've been anxious through all of it how, like how walk me through how it's been. Last year I was definitely more anxious about you know going through the process COVID everything was going on I was a junior didn't have a lot of tape but this year I just kind of going in I knew I had a lot of tape a lot of tape I backed up um, my play backed up and really it's just as I've been progressing through this what I've noticed is teams are really just kind of looking at the person uh, you know uh, up in the first and second, maybe even third round. I mean, really, it's just like a difference between if they like you a little more than the last guy, because everybody's such a high level of play. Like, it really just depends on who they need and who they like a little more. So uh, that's one thing I kind of noticed about doing all this. But uh, at the end of the day, I play football. That's what I do. Uh, that's what I'm keep doing, and that's the main goal. How crazy is that? Because, you know, I think about like teams go for players that will fit with their organization. You know, like the quarterback situation this year, you know, with Malik and Kenny, like the quarterback situation. Some guys have Kenny Pickett going like top 10, but Malik is like the better quarterback. What's it like for an offensive lineman in terms of like, where do you feel like you could fit with an organization? Do you notice that some organizations like a different style of O-lineman than others? I'm just like curious in general. Yeah, sometimes you notice that, but at the end of the day, let me tell you, people making these mock drafts are literally just doing it for views. Um, they don't, they're not on the team, they don't know the team, and they're never gonna really, they're never really gonna know what the team needs until uh, they're drafted and walking across the stage or uh, getting a phone call. So at the end of the day, yeah, everybody can say this player is good and teams will understand that, um, but I feel like a lot of it's just 
you know, what that team feels like is going to be the best pick for their future. So it could be, it could be really the smallest thing that says, hey, like this guy's going to be it for the next couple of years, or this is going to be somebody we need, or you know, this is not somebody we want. So it could really, it really just depends on what the team wants, and nobody's ever going to know. Yeah, teams have needs, um, but they could take a person who's not as good of his talent, but will fit better and mesh better with chemistry for the team, uh, rather than someone who's not far better, but better. Obviously, no matter who you get drafted by, you're going to be happy to go wherever you want. But I'm curious, have a favorite team growing up? Who did who'd you have? Who did you kind of keep your eye on when you were looking up? Growing up as a young kid, um, you know, I really looked up to Ray Lewis. You know, similar backstory, similar kind of uh, similar situation, um, how he grew up and trauma he went through. So. Uh, he was somebody I definitely looked up to, and uh, you know I just wanted to kind of be like him. I mean, I didn't play a linebacker or anything, but uh, but I definitely loved uh, playing football with him, his kind of mentality, and um, you just look up to him a lot as an idol. So I love the Baltimore Ravens for sure. Uh, you know, I was rooting for them when they won the Super Bowl finally uh, before he retired. But after they, after he retired, had re-retired. And, yeah, after the whole team kind of got disbanded, so uh, I really, I really had a team that I've loved since then. If I was lucky enough to be a, a general manager of a football team, why should I draft Darian Kennard? I'm a future Hall of Famer. Simple as that. <laughs> there you go, Hall <laughs> of Famer. We certainly hope so. Here's what the mock drafts look like for Darian: round two or early, early round three is what is expected. But one analyst does have him all the way at pick 122 in the fourth round. We'll be stunned if he's still waiting on a call Saturday. All right, coming up next on BBN tonight, we're sticking with our draft previews. Wondell Robinson hopes to hear his name called early as well. So we're looking into his draft status when we come back. Derek Kennard, right tackle. For me, it felt like a family environment. Coming in, I felt like coaches had my back always. They had my back, regardless. Uh, they took care of us as players and they treated me like family. Being part of the Big Blue Wall has just been an amazing experience. I felt like being a part of the Big Blue Wall is just something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life and I'm going to carry with pride. The biggest thing about the Big Blue Wall uh, is Coach Slarman. You know, that started when he was here and uh, it's still carrying on and guys still here are still playing for him. I think it's one of the biggest things that I enjoyed about Kentucky is just uh, the fan base. They loved they loved the player regardless of a bad game or a good game. Uh, they they loved the they loved our guys. They loved us. They loved the players, and uh, they just genuinely showed support and love for us as a fan base. And it, it meant a lot to me to be able to go out there after every game and just take 30 minutes to take pictures, sign stuff, 